Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'll be fixing my mom's iPod Nano 7th generation. The LCD has randomly started to die, so I thought I'd fix it up for her. If the 7th generation Nano is anything like previous models, we're in for a challenging repair. This has to be the strangest iPod ever made. The best way to describe it is it's between an iPod and iPod Touch. As far as I'm aware, it's the only Apple device to ever feature a built-in radio. Aside from that, the home button and icons are round, it has three volume buttons, the third of which controls the music like on Apple's headphones. This iPod is also so thin the display doesn't even sit flush on the body of the device. To fix this iPod, I've ordered a new LCD screen. It's separate from the touch panel, so we should only have to replace this one part. Along with the iPod, Mum says her headphones have gone quiet and she could barely hear them. This is quite a common issue with Apple headphones, so I'll address that too. I'll start by applying some heat to the back of the iPod, as this will be our point of entry. My plastic tools were not thin enough to get between the frame and plastic antenna cover, so I resorted to using a blade. It's important not to insert the blade too far, as you could slice through the antenna. I can't remove the cover just yet, as the antenna is still attached to the back. It'll need to be separated first. Under the antenna is a spacer that'll also need to come out. All of this needs to be done so we can access the two Phillips screws holding the display in. With those screws removed, the display can now be opened up like an iPhone from the same period, at least in theory. It's not wanting to budge easily. I can work my pick around the edges in an effort to get under the metal frame which the screen is adhered to. The problem, this frame is about a millimetre thick and has a tendency to bend out of shape. But paired with adhesive on the sides, it's just about impossible to get this display up without bending it. I was able to unlatch the left side with relative ease, but the right side put up a serious fight. This LCD panel is unlikely to make it out in one piece. After finally getting the right side unlatched, the display can be hinged upward. Beneath, three cables, two of which can be disconnected, while the other will have to remain. With the screen loose, we can see the third soldered in cable runs to the battery. I'm not surprised, but this practice is really unacceptable. They could fit a connector for the LCD and digitizer, so why not the battery? As it can't be unplugged, I'll need to carefully remove it from the back of the display and put it aside. The included pull tab wasn't much use, so I resorted to prying it out. With the display free, we get an internal look at the iPod Nano 7th generation. The logic board is quite small, and there really isn't anything else to see. So it's time we fix the LCD. It's fastened into place with six screws, three of which are on both sides of the display assembly. After those are removed, there is one bracket before the LCD can be lifted out of place. Before installing the new panel, I'll need to get the digitizer reattached to the frame. This is where I run into my first issue. The digitizer is broken. One of the cables has just completely become detached. It's not ripped, it's just fallen off. I don't know how exactly it was attached, but it wasn't solder. What this means is I now have an extra part to replace. This is as far as we'll need to disassemble the iPod Nano. Now it's time to get out our new parts and get everything reinstalled. That new digitizer costs $7, which is very cheap. However, I wasn't able to find one that came with the metal frame, meaning we'll have to salvage the one we have. I'll need to try and get this up without damaging it further, although like I said earlier, it's very flimsy. Now comes the important part. I'll need to straighten this back. Luckily, I didn't snap the frame in any places, meaning all I need to do is just try and get it back into the right shape. The last thing we'll need to take from our old digitizer is the home button. Our new digitizer didn't come with a home button, and I couldn't find a replacement one online, as I was originally going to change the display to be black in color. As I didn't want a black screen with a white home button, I just opted to keep the screen white as it was originally. After the home button's back into position, it's time to attach the metal frame. The included adhesive was just too thick for the job, so I had to resort to the more messy approach of using liquid-based glue. With 
With all the glue applied, the frame can be positioned into place. This glue takes a while to cure and should be held in place firmly using rubber bands or something similar. However, as the frame was just too flimsy, I had to hold it in place using my fingers for about 10 minutes until the glue started to cure. After adhering the home button cable into place, it's time to prep the new screen for installation. I'll firstly need to remove this piece of plastic from the old display and install it onto our new one. I believe this just protects the cable from the battery, which we install later on. After the display's protective film is removed, I can clean up our new digitizer before we install the LCD. This is a vital step as we want to make sure there's no fingerprints, dust or remaining adhesive sitting between the display and the glass. With the screen in, I can reattach the retaining bracket and adhere the new display cable. With all six screws in place, it's time to test the new LCD and digitizer. I'll connect the two required cables before we see how our hard work has paid off. Connecting a charger, we can see this iPod spring into life. That new LCD and touchscreen is working as it should, but the screen isn't positioned right. It seems I've installed the metal frame too low. While only cosmetic, I always want to do the best repair job I can. So I'll disassemble the display a second time and re-glue the frame a few millimetres higher. I'll need to be careful not to damage our new digitizer while removing the frame or old adhesive, as I don't have another replacement. The top section of the frame should stick out from the glass, as it acts as a wedge under the frame when the screen is installed. I found the best way to align the frame is to make sure you can see all four edges of the white border on the touchscreen. Once the glass has been cleaned off, the display panel can be reinstalled. Hopefully this time, everything will be lined up much better. I'll connect the display and digitizer flex cables before we test the iPod out for a second time. This time around, it's much better. Still more room at the top than bottom, but it was even like this before we disassembled it. Now happy with my result, I can get the display attached. Before clipping it down, I'll need to remove all the residual adhesive. Now I can simply slot in the top section and press firmly down on the display. Once it's clipped into position, it's time to flip over to the back of the iPod. Here, I'll need to fasten the two Phillips head screws that secure the bottom half of the display. After which, the plastic filler piece can be installed along with the Bluetooth antenna. There is some adhesive on top which I'll remove before applying a small amount of new stuff. This is just to help hold on the plastic piece which will go in next. To further support this piece, I'll install a little bit of extra liquid adhesive around the perimeter. With the cover now in place, I'll install some rubber bands to secure everything down while the glue dries. While the glue cures, let's fix these Apple headphones with low volume. The issue is caused by a buildup of earwax that has accumulated on the other side of the earbud mesh. The fix? Just remove this mesh. I've never had an issue with removing these and it always fixes the issue. With one done, it's time for the other. Coming back a few hours later, I can remove those rubber bands and see how our iPod looks. I think it's looking good, but there's still one thing left to do, and that's removing the plastic protective film. And we're done. So this is it. I've successfully repaired my mum's iPod Nano 7. While not the easiest of devices to repair, it wasn't as bad as the iPod Nano 5th generation. The replacement glass is a slightly off-white colour, which I've seen before with cheap replacements. However, this is only cosmetic. Everything else about the iPod is working perfectly, including the headphones we also fixed. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the MP3 player playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. 
That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.